This is Chicken Soup for the Soul, 101 Stories to Open the Heart and Rekindle the Spirit. A Little Girl's Dream. The promise was a long time keeping, but then so was the dream. In the early 1950s, in a small Southern California town, a little girl hefted yet another load of books onto the tiny library's counter. The girl was a reader. Her parents had books all over their home, but not always the ones she wanted. So she'd make her weekly trek to the yellow library with the brown trim, the little one-room building where the children's library actually was just a nook. Frequently, she ventured out of that nook in search of heftier fare. As the white-haired librarian hand-stamped the due dates in the 10-year-old's choices, the little girl looked longingly at the new book prominently displayed on the counter. She marveled again at the wonder of writing a book and having it honored like that, right there for the world to see. That particular day, she confessed her goal. When I grow up, she said, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to write books. The librarian looked up from her stamping and smiled, not with the condescension so many children receive, but with encouragement. When you do write that book, she replied, bring it into our library and we'll put it on display right here on the counter. The little girl promised she would. As she grew, so did her dream. She got her first job in ninth grade, writing brief personality profiles which earned her $1.50 each from the local newspaper. The money palled in comparison with the magic of seeing her words on paper. A book was a long way off. She edited her high school paper, married, and started a family, but the itch to write burned deep. She got a part-time job covering school news at a weekly newspaper. It kept her brain busy as she balanced babies, but no book. She went to work full time for a major daily, even tried her hand at magazines, still no book. Finally, she believed she had something to say and started a book. She sent it off to two publishers and was rejected. She put it away, sadly. Several years later, the old dream increased in persistence. She got an agent and wrote another book. She pulled the other out of hiding and soon both were sold. But the world of book publishing moves slower than that of daily newspapers and she waited two long years. The day the box arrived on her doorstep with its free author's copies, she ripped it open. Then she cried. She'd waited so long to hold her dream in her hands. Then she remembered that librarian's invitation and her promise. Of course, that particular librarian had died long ago, and the little library had been raised to make way for a larger incarnation. The woman called and got the name of the head librarian. She wrote a letter telling her how much her predecessor's words had meant to the girl. She'd be in town for her 30th high school reunion, she wrote, and could she please bring her two books by and give them to the library? It would mean so much to that 10-year-old girl and seemed a way of honoring all the librarians who had ever encouraged a child. The librarian called and said, come. So she did, clutching a copy of each book. She found the big new library right across the street from her old high school, just opposite the room where she'd struggled through algebra, mourning the necessity of a subject that writers would surely never use and nearly on top of the spot where her old house once stood, the neighborhood demolished for a civic center and this looming library. Inside, the librarian welcomed her warmly. She introduced a reporter from the local newspaper, a descendant of the paper she begged a chance to write for long ago. Then she presented her books to the librarian who placed them on the counter with a sign of explanation. Tears rolled down the woman's cheeks. Then she hugged the librarian and left, pausing for a picture outside, which proved that dreams can come true and promises can be kept, 
even if it takes 38 years. The 10-year-old girl and the writer she'd become posed by the library sign right next to the reader board, which said, Welcome back, Jan Mitchell. A salesman's first sale. Keep away from people who try to belittle your ambitions. Small people always do that, but the really great make you feel that you too can become great. And that's Mark Twain. I hurried home one Saturday afternoon in the fall of 1993 to try to get some much needed yard work done. While raking leaves, my five-year-old son, Nick, came over and pulled on my pants leg. Dad, I need you to make me a sign, he said. Not now, Nick, I'm real busy, was my reply. But I need a sign, he persisted. What for, Nick, I asked. I'm going to sell some of my rocks, was his answer. Nick has always been fascinated with rocks and stones. He's collected them from all over and people bring them to him. There is a basket full of rocks in the garage that he periodically cleans, sorts, and restacks. They are his treasures. I don't have time to mess with it right now, Nick. I have to get these leaves raked, I said. Go have your mom help you. A short while later, Nick returned with a sheet of paper. On it, in his five-year-old handwriting, were the words, on sale today, one dollar. His mom had helped him make his sign and he was now in business. He took his sign, a small basket, and four of his best rocks and walked to the end of our driveway. There he arranged the rocks in a line, set the basket behind them and sat down. I watched from the distance, amused at his determination. After half an hour or so, not a single person had passed by. I walked down the drive to see how he was doing. How's it going, Nick, I asked. Good, he replied. What's the basket for, I asked. To put the money in, was his matter-of-fact answer. How much are you asking for your rocks? A dollar each, Nick said. Nick, nobody will pay you a dollar for a rock. Yes, they will. Nick, there isn't enough traffic on our street for people to see your rocks. Why don't you pack these up and go play? Yes, there is, Dad, he countered. People walk and ride their bikes on our street for exercise, and some people drive their cars to look at the houses. There's enough people. Having failed to convince Nick of the futility of his efforts, I went back to my yard work. He patiently remained at his post. A short while later, a minivan came driving down the street. I watched as Nick perked up, holding his sign up and pointing it at the van. As it slowly passed, I saw a young couple craning their necks to read his sign. They continued on around the cul-de-sac, and as they approached Nick again, the lady rolled down her window. I couldn't hear the conversation, but she turned to the man driving, and I could see him reaching for his billfold. He handed her a dollar and she got out of the van and walked over to Nick. After examining the rocks, she picked up one, gave Nick the dollar, and then drove off. I sat in the yard, amazed, as Nick ran up to me. Waving the dollar, he shouted, I told you I could sell one rock for a dollar. If you believe in yourself, you can do anything. I went and got my camera and took a picture of Nick and his sign. The little guy had held tough to his belief and delighted in showing what he could do. It was a great lesson in how not to raise children, but we all learn from it and talk about it to this day. Later that day, my wife, Tony, Nick, and I went out to dinner. On the way, Nick asked us if he could have an allowance. His mom explained that an allowance must be earned and we would have to determine what his responsibilities would be. That's okay, said Nick, how much will I get? At five years old, how about a dollar a week, said Tony. From the back seat came, a dollar a week? I can make that selling one rock. These are all true stories. Okay, let's walk through the garden again. 
It is one of the most beautiful compensations of this life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. Ralph Waldo Emerson. I am a public speaker who teaches fellow Canadians creative ways to buy real estate. One of my very first graduates, a policeman named Roy, used my ideas in a most touching way. The story begins years before Roy attended my course. On his regular rounds, he was in the habit of dropping in on an elderly gentleman who lived in a breathtaking 5,000 square foot mansion overlooking a ravine. The older man had lived there most of his life and cherished the view, the many mature trees and the creek. When Roy would check in on him once or twice a week, the old man would offer him tea and they would sit and chat or stroll for a few minutes through the garden. One such visit was sad. The older man tearfully admitted that his health was failing and he had to sell his beautiful home and move into a nursing home. By this time, Roy had taken my course and came up with the crazy idea that he might be able to use the creativity of my course to figure out how to buy this mansion. The man wanted $300,000 for his home, which had no mortgage. Roy had only $3,000 in savings. Roy was paying $500 in rent at the time and he had a reasonable policeman's salary. It seemed insurmountable to come up with a plan to create a deal between the man and the hopeful policeman. Insurmountable until you take into account the power of love. Roy remembered the words of my course to find out what the vendor wa truly wants and give it to him. After delving as deeply as he could, Roy finally found the key. What the man was going to miss the most was walking through his garden. Roy blurted out, if you let me buy your house somehow, I promise to pick you up one or two Sundays a month, bring you back here to your garden and let you sit here and stroll around in it with me like old times. The old man smiled in wonder and love. The old man told Roy to write up whatever offer seemed fair and he'd sign it. Roy offered all he could afford. The purchase price was $300,000. The ta down payment was $3,000. The vendor took back a $297,000 first mortgage bearing interest at $500 a month. The old man was so happy that as a present, he let Roy have all the antique furniture in the whole house, including a grand baby, a baby grand piano. As amazed as Roy was at his incredible financial victory, the real winner was the happy old man and the relationship that the two of them shared. Eighteen Holes in His Mind Major James Nesmith had a dream of improving his golf game, and he developed a unique method of achieving his goal. Until he devised this method, he was just your average weekend golfer, shooting in the mid to low 90s. Then, for seven years, he completely quit the game, never touched a club, never set foot on a fairway. Ironically, it was during this seven-year break from the game that Major Nesmith came up with his amazingly effective technique for improving his game, a technique we can all learn from. In fact, the first time he set foot on a golf course after his hiatus from the game, he shot an astonishing 74. He had cut 20 strokes off his average without having swung a golf club in seven years. Unbelievable. Not only that, but his physical condition had actually deteriorated during those seven years. What was Major Nesmith's secret? Visualization. You see, Major Nesmith had spent those seven years as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. During those seven years, he was imprisoned in a cage that was approximately four and one half feet high and five feet long. During the, um, almost the entire time he was imprisoned, he saw no one, talked to no one, and experienced no physical activity. 
During the first few months, he did virtually nothing but hope and pray for his release. Then he realized he had to find some way to occupy his mind or he would lose his sanity and probably his life. That's when he learned to visualize. In his mind, he selected his favorite golf course and started playing golf. Every day, he played a full 18 holes at the imaginary country club of his dreams. He experienced everything to the last detail. He saw himself dressed in his golfing clothes. He smelled the fragrance of the trees and the freshly trimmed grass. He experienced different weather conditions, windy spring days, overcast winter days, and sunny summer mornings. In his imagination, every detail of the tea, the individual blades of grass, the trees, the singing birds, the scampering squirrels, and the lay of the course became totally real. He felt the grip of the club in his hands. He instructed himself as he practiced smoothing out his downswing and the follow through on his shot. Then he watched the ball arc down the exact center of the fairway, bounce a couple of times and roll to the exact spot he had selected, all in his mind. In the real world, he was in no hurry. He had no place to go. So in his mind, he took every step on his way to the ball, just as if he were physically on the course. It took him just as long in imaginary time to play 18 holes as it would have taken in reality. Not a detail was omitted. Not once did he ever miss a shot, never a hook or a slice, never a missed putt. Seven days a week, four hours a day, 18 holes, seven years, 20 strokes off, shot a 74. Keep your goals in sight. When she looked ahead, Florence Chadwick saw nothing but a solid wall of fog. Her body was numb. She had been swimming for nearly 16 hours. Already, she was the first woman to swim the English Channel in both directions. Now, at age 34, her goal was to become the first woman to swim from Catalina Island to the California coast. On that 4th of July morning in 1952, the sea was like an ice bath and the fog was so dense she could hardly see her support boats. Sharks cruised toward her lone figure only to be driven away by rifle shots. Against the frigid grip of the sea, she struggled on hour after hour while millions watched on national television. Alongside Florence in one of the boats, her mother and her trainer offered encouragement. They told her it wasn't much farther, but all she could see was fog. They urged her not to quit. She never had until then. With only a half mile to go, she asked to be pulled out. Still thawing her chilled body several hours later, she told a reporter, look, I'm not excusing myself, but if I could have seen land, I might have made it. It was not fatigue or even the cold water that defeated her. It was the fog. She was unable to see her goal. Two months later, she tried again. This time, despite the same dense fog, she swam with her faith intact and her goal clearly pictured in her mind. She knew that somewhere behind that fog was land, and this time she made it. Florence Chadwick became the first woman to swim the Catalina Channel, eclipsing the men's record by two hours. The Cowboy's Story. When I started my telecommunications company, I knew I was going to need salespeople to help me expand the business. I put the word out that I was looking for qualified salespeople and began the interviewing process. The salesperson I had in mind was experienced in the telemarketing communications industry, knew the local market, had experience with the various types of systems available, had a professional demeanor and was a self-starter. I had very little time to train a person, so it was important that the salesperson I hired 
could hit the ground running. During the tiresome process of interviewing prospective salespeople, into my office walked a cowboy. I knew he was a cowboy by the way he was dressed. He had on corduroy pants and a corduroy jacket that didn't match the pants. A short sleeved snap button shirt, a tie that came about halfway down his chest with a knot bigger than my fist, cowboy boots, and a baseball cap. You can imagine what I was thinking. Not what I had in mind for my new company. He sat down in front of my desk, took his cap off, and said, Mr. I just sure appreciate a chance to be a success in the telephone business. And that's just how he said it, too. Business. I was trying to figure out a way to tell this fellow, without being too blunt, that he just wasn't what I had in mind at all. I asked him about his background. He said he had a degree in agriculture from Oklahoma State University and that he had been a ranch hand in Bartlesville, Oklahoma for the past few years during the summers. He announced that was all over now. He was ready to be a success in business and he would just sure appreciate a chance. We continued to talk. He was so focused on success and how he would sure appreciate a chance that I decided to give him a chance. I told him that I would spend two days with him. In those two days, I would teach him everything I thought he needed to know to sell one type of very small telephone system. At the end of those two days, he would be on his own. He asked me how much money I thought he could make. I told him, looking like you look, and knowing what you know, the best you can do is about $1,000 per month. I went on to explain that the average commission on the small telephone systems he would be selling was approximately $250 per system. I told him if he would see 100 prospects per month, that he would sell four of those prospects a telephone system. Selling four telephone systems would give him $1,000. I hired him on straight commission with no base salary. He said that sounded great to him because the most he had ever made was $400 per month as a ranch hand and he was ready to make some money. The next morning I sat him down to cram as much of the telephone business I could into a 22 year old cowboy with no business experience, no telephone experience and no sales experience. He looked like anything but a professional salesperson in the telecommunications business. In fact, he had none of the qualities I was looking for in an employee except one. He had an incredible focus on being a success. At the end of two days of training, Cowboy, that's what I called him then and still do, went to his cubicle. He took out a sheet of paper and wrote down four things. One. I will be a success in business. Two, I will see 100 people per month. Three, I will sell four telephone systems per month. Four, I will make $1,000 per month. He placed a sheet of paper on the cubicle wall in front of him and started to work. At the end of the first month, he hadn't sold four telephone systems. However, at the end of his first 10 days, he had sold seven telephone systems. At the end of his first year, Cowboy hadn't earned $12,000 in commission. Instead, he had earned over $60,000 in commissions. He was indeed amazing. One day he walked into my office with a contract and payment on a telephone system. I asked him how he had sold this one. He said, I just told her, ma'am, if it don't do nothing but ring and you answer it, it's a heck of a lot prettier than that one you got. She bought it. The woman wrote him a check in full for the telephone system, but Cowboy wasn't really sure I would take a check, so he drove her to the bank and had her get cash to pay for the system. He carried thousand dollar bills into my office and said, Larry, did I do good? I assured him that he did good. After three years, he owned half of my company. At the end of another year, he owned three other companies. 
At that time, we separated as business partners. He was driving a $32,000 black pickup truck. He was wearing $600 cowboy cut suits, $500 cowboy boots, and a three carat horseshoe shaped diamond ring. He had become a success in business. What made Cowboy a success? Was it because he was a hard worker? That helped. Was it because he was smarter than everyone else? No. He knew nothing about the telephone business when he started. So what was it? I believe it was because he knew the yagadas for success. He was focused on success. He knew that's what he wanted and he went after it. He took responsibility. He took responsibility for where he was, who he was, and what he was, a ranch hand. Then he took action to make it different. He made a decision to leave the ranch in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and to look for opportunities to become a success. He changed. There was no way that he could keep doing the things that he had been doing and receive different results. And he was willing to do what was necessary to make success happen for him. He had vision and goals. He saw himself as a success. He also had written down specific goals. He wrote down the four items that he intended to accomplish and put them on the wall in front of him. He saw those goals every day and focused on their accomplishment. He put action to his goals and stayed with it even when it got tough. It wasn't always easy for him. He experienced slumps like everyone does. He got more doors slammed in his face and telephones in his ear than any salesperson I have ever known, but he never let it stop him. He kept on going. He asked, boy did he ask. First he asked me for a chance, then he asked nearly all the people he came across if they wanted to buy a telephone system from him. And his asking paid off. As he likes to put it, even a blind hog finds an acorn every once in a while. That simply means that if you ask enough, eventually someone will say yes. He cared. He cared about me and his customers. He discovered that when he cared more about taking care of his customers than he cared about taking care of himself, it wasn't long before he didn't have to worry about taking care of himself. Most of all, Cowboy started every day as a winner. He hit the front door expecting something good to happen. He believed that things were going to go his way regardless of what happened. He had no expectation of failure, only an expectation of success. And I found that when you expect success and take action on that expectation, you almost always get success. Cowboy has made millions of dollars. He has also lost it all, only to get it all back again. In his life, as in mine, it has been that once you know and practice the principles of success, they will work for you again and again. He can also be an inspiration to you. He is proof that it's not environment or education or technical skills and ability that make you a success. He proves that it takes more. It takes the principles we so often overlook or take for granted. These are the principles of the Yagadas for success. Why wait? Just do it. The big question is whether you are going to be able to say a hearty yes to your adventure. Joseph Campbell my father told me that God must surely have a reason for me being the way I am today. I'm beginning to believe it. I was the kind of kid that things always worked out for. I grew up in Laguna Beach, California, and I loved surfing and sports. But at a time when most kids my age thought only of TV and the beach, I started thinking of ways I could become more independent, see the country, and plan my future. I began working at the age of 10. By the time I was 15, I worked between one to three jobs after school. I made enough money to buy a new motorcycle. I didn't even know how to ride it. 
But after paying cash for the bike and one year's worth of full insurance coverage, I went to parking lots and learned to ride it. After 15 minutes of figure eights, I rode home. I was 15 and a half, had just received my driver's permit and had bought a new motorcycle. It changed my life. I wasn't one of those just for fun weekend riders. I loved to ride. Every spare minute of every day, every chance I got, I averaged 100 miles a day on top of that bike. Sunsets and sunrises looked prettier when I enjoyed them from a winding mountain road. Even now, I can close my eyes and still feel the bike naturally beneath me, so naturally that it was a more familiar feeling than walking. As I rode, the cool wind gave me a feeling of total relaxation. While I explored the open road outside, inside I was dreaming about what I wanted my life to be. Two years and five new motorcycles later, I ran out of roads in California. I read a motorcycle, I read motorcycle magazines every night, and one night a BMW motorcycle ad caught my eye. It showed a muddy motorcycle with a duffel bag on the back parked on the side of a dirt road in front of a large Welcome to Alaska sign. One year later, I took a photograph of an even muddier motorcycle in front of that exact same sign. Yes, it was me. At 17 years old, I made it to Alaska alone with my bike, conquering over 1,000 miles of dirt highway. Prior to departing for my seven week, 17,000 mile camping adventure, my friends said that I was crazy. My, friends said, my parents said that I should wait. Crazy? Wait? For what? Since I was a kid, I had dreamed about going across America on a motorcycle. Something strong inside of me told me that if I didn't go on this trip now, I never would. Besides, when would I have the time? I would be starting college on a scholarship very soon, then a career perhaps even a family someday. I didn't know if it was just to satisfy me or if in my mind I felt it would somehow transform me from a boy to a man. But what I did know was that for that summer, I was going on the adventure of a lifetime. I quit all of my jobs and because I was only 17, I had my mother write a letter stating that I had her permission to go on this trip. With $1,400 in my pocket, two duffel bags, a shoe box full of maps strapped to the back of my motorcycle, a pen flashlight for protection, and a lot of enthusiasm, I left for Alaska and the East Coast. I met a lot of people, enjoyed the rugged beauty and lifestyle, ate off the open fire, and thanked God every day for giving me this opportunity. Sometimes I didn't see or hear anyone for two or three days and just rode my motorcycle in endless silence with only the wind racing around my helmet. I didn't cut my hair. I took cold showers at campgrounds when I could and I even had several unscheduled confrontations with theirs during that trip. It was the greatest adventure. Even though I took several more trips, None can ever compare to that summer. It has always held a special place in my life. I can never go back again and explore the roads and mountains, the forests and glacial waters the same way I did back then on that trip, alone with my motorcycle. I can never make the same trip in the exact same way because at the age of 23, I was in a motorcycle accident on a street in Laguna Beach where I was hit by a drunk driver slash drug dealer who left me paralyzed from the ribs down. At the time of my accident, I was in great shape, both physically and mentally. I was a full-time police officer, still riding my motorcycle on my days off. I was married and financially secure. I had it made, but in the space of less than a second, my whole life changed. I spent eight months in the hospital, got divorced, saw that I could not return to work in the way that I had known it. And along with learning how to deal with chronic pain and a wheelchair, 
I saw all the dreams I had for my future leaving my reach. Luckily for me, help and support help new dreams to develop and be fulfilled. When I think back to all of those trips I took, all of those roads that I traveled, I think of how lucky I was to have been able to do that. Every time I rode, I always said to myself, do it now. Enjoy your surroundings, even if you're at a smoggy city intersection. Enjoy life because you cannot depend on getting a second chance to be in the same place or do the same things. After my accident, my father said that God had a reason for me being a paraplegic. I believe it. It has made me a stronger person. I returned to work as a desk officer, bought a home and married again. I also have my own consulting business and I'm a professional speaker. Every now and again, when things get rough, I remind myself of all the things that I have accomplished, all the things I have yet to accomplish and my father's words. Yes, he was right. God sure did have a reason. Most importantly, I remind myself to enjoy every moment of every day. And if you can do something, do it. Do it now. Consider this. Effort only fully releases its reward after a person refuses to quit. Napoleon Hill. History has demonstrated that the most notable winners usually encountered heartbreaking obstacles before they triumphed. They won because they refused to become discouraged by their defeats. B.C. Forbes. Consider this. Woody Allen, Academy Award winning writer, producer, and director, flunked a motion picture production at New York University and the City College of New York. He also failed English at New York University. Leon Uris, author of the bestseller Exodus, failed high school English three times. When Lucille Ball began studying to be an actress in 1927, she was told by the head instructor of the John Murray Anderson Drama School, try any other profession, any other. In 1959, a Universal Pictures executive dismissed Clint Eastwood and Burt Reynolds at the same meeting with the following statements. To Burt Reynolds, you have no talent. To Clint Eastwood, you have a chip on your tooth, your Adam's apple sticks out too far, and you talk too slow. As you no doubt know, Burt Reynolds and Clint Eastwood went on to become big stars in the movie industry. In 1944, Emmeline Snively, director of the Blue Book Modeling Agency, told modeling hopeful Norma Jean Baker, Marilyn Monroe, you'd better learn secretarial work or else get married. Liv Ullman, who was nominated two times for the Academy Award for Best Actress, failed an audition for the State Theatre School in Norway. The judges told her she had no talent. Malcolm Forbes, the late editor-in-chief of Forbes magazine, one of the most successful business publications in the world, failed to make the staff of the school newspaper when he was an undergraduate at Princeton University. In 1962, four nervous young musicians played their first record audition for the executives of the Decca Recording Company. The executives were not impressed. While turning down this British rock group called the Beatles, one executive said, we don't like their sound. Groups of guitars are on the way out. Paul Cohen, Nashville, artists and repertoire men for Decca Records, while firing Buddy Holly from the Decca label in 1956, called Holly the biggest no talent I ever worked with. 20 years later, Rolling Stone called Holly, along with Chuck Berry, the major influence on the rock music of the 60s. In 1954, Jimmy Denny, manager of the Grand Ole Opry, fired Elvis Presley after one performance. He told Presley, you ain't going nowhere, son. You ought to go back to driving a truck. Elvis Presley went on to become the most popular singer in America. 
When Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone in 1876, it did not ring off the hook with calls from potential backers. After making a demonstration call, President Rutherford Hayes said, that's an amazing invention, but who would ever want to use one of them? Thomas Edison was probably the greatest inventor in American history. When he first attended school in Port Huron, Michigan, his teachers complained that he was too slow and hard to handle. As a result, Edison's mother decided to take her son out of school and teach him at home. The young Edison was fascinated by science. At the age of 10, he had already set up his first chemistry laboratory. Edison's inexhaustible energy and genius, which he reportedly defined as 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, eventually produced in his lifetime more than 1,300 inventions. When Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, he tried over 2,000 experiments before he got it to work. A young reporter asked him how it felt to fail so many times. He said, I never failed once. I invented the light bulb. It just happened to be a 2,000 step process. In the 1940s, another young inventor named Chester Carlson took his idea to 20 corporations, including some of the biggest in the country. They all turned him down. In 1947, after seven long years of rejection, he finally got a tiny company in Rochester, New York, the Halloid Company, to purchase the rights to his electrostatic paper copying process. Halloid became Xerox Corporation, and both it and Carlson became very rich. John Milton became blind at age 44. 16 years later, he wrote the, cl he wrote the classic Paradise Lost. When Pablo Casals reached 95, a young reporter threw him the following question. Mr. Casals, you are 95 and the greatest cellist that ever lived. Why do you still practice six hours a day? Mr. Casals answered, because I think I'm making progress. After years of progressive hearing loss, by age 46, German composer Ludwig van Beethoven had become completely deaf. Nevertheless, he wrote his greatest music, including five symphonies during his later years. After having lost both legs in an air crash, British fighter pilot Douglas Bader rejoined the British Royal Air Force with two artificial limbs. During World War II, he was captured by the Germans three times, and three times he escaped. After having his cancer-ridden leg amputated, young Canadian Terry Fox vowed to run on one leg from coast to coast the entire length of Canada to raise $1 million for cancer research. Forced to quit halfway when the cancer invaded his lungs, he and the foundation he started have raised over $20 million for cancer research. Wilma Rudolph was the 20th of 22 children. She was born prematurely and her survival was doubtful. When she was four years old, she contracted double pneumonia and scarlet fever, which left her with a paralyzed left leg. At age nine, she removed the metal leg brace she had been dependent on and began to walk without it. By 13, she had developed the rhythmic walk, which doctors said was a miracle. That same year, she decided to become a runner. She entered a race and came in last. For the next few years, every race she entered, she came in last. Everyone told her to quit, but she kept on running. One day, she actually won a race and then another. From then on, she won every race she entered. Eventually, this little girl, who was told she would never walk again, went on to win three Olympic gold medals. My mother taught me very early to believe I could achieve any accomplishment I wanted to. The first was to walk without braces. Wilma Rudolph. Franklin D. Roosevelt was paralyzed by polio at the age of 39, and yet he went on to become one of America's most beloved and influential leaders. 
He was elected President of the United States four times. Sarah Bernhardt, who was regarded by many as one of the greatest actresses who ever lived, had her leg amputated as a result of an injury when she was 70 years old, but she continued to act for the next eight years. Louis L'Amour, successful author of over 100 Western novels with over 200 million copies in print, received 350 rejections before he made his first sale. He later became the first American novelist to receive a special Congressional Gold Medal in recognition of his distinguished career as an author and contributor to the nation through the historically based works. In 1953, Julia Child and her two collaborators signed a publishing contract to produce a book tentatively titled French Cooking for the American Kitchen. Julia and her colleagues worked on the book for five years. The publisher rejected the 850 page manuscript Child and her partners worked for another year, totally revising the manuscript. Again, the publisher rejected it, but Julia Child did not give up. She and her collaborators went back to work again, found a new publisher, and in 1961, eight years after beginning, they published Mastering the Art of French Cooking, which has sold more than 1 million copies. In 1966, Time Magazine featured Julia Child on its cover. Julia Child is still at the top of her field almost 30 years later. General Douglas MacArthur might never have gained power and fame without persistence. When he applied for admission to West Point, he was turned down, not once, but twice. He tried a third time, was accepted, and marched into the history books. Abraham Lincoln entered the Black Hawk War as a captain. By the end of the war, he had been demoted to the rank of private. In 1952, Edmund Hillary attempted to climb Mount Everest, the highest mountain then known to humans, 29,000 feet straight up. A few weeks after his failed attempt, he was asked to address a group in England. Hillary walked to the edge of the stage, made a fist, and pointed at a picture of the mountain. He said in a loud voice, Mount Everest, you beat me the first time, but I'll beat you the next time because you've grown all you are going to grow, but I'm still growing. On May 29, only one year later, Edmund Hillary succeeded in becoming the first man to mount, climb Mount Everest. 39 years, too short, too long, long enough. Oh, the worst of all tragedies is not to die young, but to live until I am 75, and yet not ever truly to have lived. Martin Luther King Jr. Nothing but problems. The man who has no problems is out of the game, Albert Hubbard. On Christmas Eve 1993, Norman Vincent Peale, the author of the all-time bestseller, The Power of Positive Thinking, died at age 95. He was at home surrounded by love, peace, and tender care. Norman Vincent Peale deserved nothing less. His positive thinking ministry had brought peace and renewed confidence to generations of people who realized from his sermons, speeches, radio shows, and books that we are responsible for the condition we're in. Since he felt God did not make junk, Norman reminded us that we have two choices every morning when we wake up. We can choose to feel great, good about ourselves or choose to feel lousy. I can still hear Norman clearly shouting out, why would you choose the latter? I first met Norman in July 1986. Larry Hughes, who was president of my publishing company, William Morrow and Company, had suggested we think about writing a book together on ethics. We decided to do that, and the next two years working with Norman on the power of ethical management was one of the greatest delights I have ever had in my life. Ever since that first meeting, Norman had a great impact on my life. He always contended that positive thinkers get positive results 
because they are not afraid of problems. In fact, rather than thinking of a problem as something that is negative and ought to be removed as quickly as possible, Norman felt problems were a sign of life. To illustrate that point, here is one of his favorite stories, one I have used frequently in my presentations. One day I was walking down the street when I saw my friend George approaching. It was evident from his downtrodden look that he wasn't overflowing with the ecstasy and exuberance of human existence, which is a high class way of saying George was dragging bottom. Naturally, I asked him, how are you, George? Well, that was meant to be a routine inquiry. George took me very seriously and for 15 minutes, he enlightened me on how bad he felt. And the more he talked, the worse I felt. Finally, I said to him, well, George, I'm sorry to see you in such a depressed state. How did you get this way? That really set him off. It's my problems, he said. Problems, nothing but problems. I'm fed up with problems. If you could get rid of all my problems, I would contribute $5,000 to your favorite charity. Well now, I am never one to turn a deaf ear to such an offer. And so I meditated, ruminated, and cogitated on the proposition and came up with an answer that I thought was pretty good. I said, yesterday I went to a place where thousands of people reside. As far as I could determine, not one of them has any problems. Would you like to go there? When can we leave? That sounds like my kind of place, answered George. If that's the case, George, I said, I'll be happy to take you tomorrow to Woodlawn Cemetery because the only people I know who don't have any problems are dead. I love that story. It really puts life in perspective. I heard Norman say many times, if you have no problems at all, I warn you, you're in grave jeopardy. You're on the way out and you don't know it. If you don't believe you have any problems, I suggest that you immediately race from wherever you are, jump into your car and drive home as fast but as safely as possible, run into your house, and go straight to your bedroom and slam the door. Then get on your knees and pray, what's the matter, Lord? Don't you trust me anymore? Give me some problems. Angels never say hello. My grandma told me about angels. She said they come knocking at the door of our hearts, trying to deliver a message to us. I saw them in my mind's eye with a big mail sack slung between their wings and a post office cap set jauntily on their head. I wondered if the stamps on their letters said Heaven Express. No use waiting for the angel to open your door, Grandma explained. You see, there is only one door handle on the door of your heart, only one bolt. They are on the inside, your side. You must listen for the angel, throw open the lock and open up that door. I loved the story and asked her again and again to tell me, what does the angel do then? The angel never says hello. You reach out and take the message and the angel gives you your instructions. Arise and go forth. Then the angel flies away. It is your responsibility to take action. When I am interviewed by the media, I am often asked how I have built several international businesses without any college education, beginning my business on foot, pushing my two children before me in a dilapidated baby stroller with a wheel that kept coming off. First, I tell the interviewers that I read at least six books a week and have done so since I was able to read. I hear the voices of all the great achievers in their books. Next, I explain that every time I hear an angel knock, I just fling open the door. The angel's messages are about new business ideas, books to write, and wonderful solutions to problems in my career and personal life. They come very often in the never ending flow, a river of ideas. However, there was one time when the knocking stopped. It happened when my daughter Lily was badly hurt in an accident. 
She was riding on the back of a forklift her father rented to move some hay for our horses. Lily and two of the neighbor children begged him to let them ride on the forklift when he took it back to the rental place. Going down the little hill, the steering gear broke. Her father almost pulled his arms out of their sockets, trying to hold the big rig on the road before it turned over. The little neighbor girl broke her arm. Lily's father was knocked unconscious. Lily was pinned underneath with the huge weight of the rig on her left hand. Gasoline spilled on her thigh. Gasoline burns even if it is not ignited. The neighbor boy was unhurt and kept his wits. He ran out and stopped traffic. We rushed Lily to orthopedic hospital where they began a long series of operations, each time amputating more of her hand. They told me that when a human limb is cut off, sometimes it can be sewn back on, but not if it is smashed and crushed. Lily had just started piano lessons. Because I am a writer, I had looked forward with great anticipation to her taking typing lessons the next year. During this time, I often drove off by myself to cry, not wanting others to see me. I couldn't stop. I found I did not have the concentration to read anything. No angels knocked. There was a heavy silence in my heart. I kept thinking of all the things Lily would never do because of this terrible accident. When we took her back to the hospital for the eighth amputation, my spirit was very low. I kept thinking over and over, she will never type, never type, never type. We set her bag down in the hospital room and suddenly turned around because a young teenage girl in the next bed said to us in a commanding voice, I've been waiting for you. You go down the hall right now, third room on the left. There's a boy there who was hurt in a motorcycle accident. You go down there and lift up his spirit right now. She had the voice of a field marshal. We immediately obeyed her. We talked to the boy and encouraged him and then came back to Lily's hospital room. For the first time, I noticed that this unusual girl was bent way over. Who are you? I asked. My name is Tony Daniels, she grinned. I go to the handicapped high school. This time the doctors are going to make me a whole inch taller. You see, I had polio. I have had many operations. She had the charisma and strength of a General Schwarzkopf. I couldn't help the words that came flying out of my mouth. I gasped, but you aren't handicapped. Oh yes, you are right, she replied, looking sideways at me. They teach us down at our school that we are never handicapped as long as we can help someone else. Now, if you met my schoolmate who teaches the typing class, you might think she is handicapped because she was born with no arms and no legs, but she helps all of us by teaching us typing with a wand between her teeth. Kabang! Suddenly I heard it, the clanging noise of pounding and kicking and yelling at the door of my heart. I ran out of the room and down the corridor to find a payphone. I called IBM and asked for the office manager. I told him my little girl had lost nearly all of her left hand and asked him if they had one hand touch typing charts. He replied, yes, we do. We have charts for the right hand, the left hand, charts that show how to use your feet with pedals and even to type with a wand between your teeth. The charts are free. Where would you like me to send them? When we were finally able to take Lily back to school, I took the one hand typing charts with me. Her hand and arm were still in a cast with big bandages around it. I asked the school new principal if Lily could take typing, even though she was too young, instead of Jim. He told me it had never been done before and that perhaps the typing teacher would not want to go to the extra trouble, but I could ask him if I wanted to. When I stepped into the typing class, I noticed immediately 
that all around the room were signs with quotations from Florence Nightingale, Ben Franklin, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Winston Churchill. I took a deep breath, realizing I was in the right place. The teacher said he had never taught one hand typing before, but that he would work with Lily every lunch period. We will learn one hand touch typing together. Soon Lily touch typed all of her homework for her English class. Her English teacher that year was a polio victim. His right arm hung helplessly by his side. He scolded her. Your mother is babying you, Lily. You have a good right hand. You do your own homework. Oh no, sir, she smiled at him. I'm up to 50 words a minute, one-handed in my touch typing. I have the one-hand IBM charts. The English teacher sat down suddenly. Then he said slowly, being able to type has always been my dream. Come on over during lunchtime. The back of my charts have the other hand. I'll teach you, Lily told him. It was after the first lunchtime lesson that she came home and said, Mama, Tony Daniels was right. I'm not handicapped anymore because I am helping someone else fulfill his dreams. Today, Lily is the author of two internationally acclaimed books. She has taught all of our office staff to use our Apple computers with our mouse pad on the left side because that is where she makes hers fly around with her remaining finger and the stump of her thumb. Shush, listen, do you hear the knocking? Throw the bolt, open the door. Please think of me and remember, angels never say hello. Their greeting is always arise and go forth. Why do these things have to happen? We are all pencils in the hand of God, Mother Teresa. One of my joys and passions is my voice. I love to perform in our local community theaters. My throat became very sore during a particularly grueling show run. It was my first time performing an operatic piece and I was terrified I had actually done damage to my vocal cords. I was a lead and we were about to open. So I made an appointment with my family doctor where I waited for an hour. I finally left in a huff, went back to work, grabbed the phone book and found a throat specialist close by. Once more, I made an appointment and off I went. The nurse showed me in and I sat down to wait for the doctor. I was feeling very disgruntled. I rarely get sick and here I was sick when I needed to be healthy. Besides, I had to take time out of my workday to go to two different doctors, both of whom kept me waiting. It was very frustrating. Why do these things have to happen? A moment later, the nurse came back in and said, may I ask you something personal? This seemed odd. What else do they ask you but personal questions in the doctor's office? But I looked at the nurse and replied, yes, of course. I noticed your hand, she said a bit hesitantly. I lost half of my left hand in a forklift accident when I was 11. I think it is one of the reasons I didn't follow my dream of performing in theater, although everyone says, gee, I never noticed, you are so natural. In the back of my mind, I thought that they only wanted to see perfect people on stage. No one would want to see me. Besides, I'm too tall, overweight, not really talented? No, they don't want to see me. But I love musical comedies and I do have a good voice. So one day I tried out at our local community theater. I was the first one they cast. That was three years ago. Since then, I have been cast in almost everything I tried out for. The nurse continued, what I need to know is how it has affected your life. Never in the 25 years since it happened has someone asked me this. Maybe they'll say, does it bother you? But never anything as sweeping as, how has it affected your life? After an awkward pause, she said, you see, I just had a baby and her hand is like yours. I, well, 
I need to know how it has affected your life. How has it affected my life? I thought about it a bit so I could think of the right words to say. Finally, I said, it has affected my life, but not in a bad way. I do many things that people with two normal hands find difficult. I type about 75 words a minute. I play guitar. I have ridden and shown horses for years. I even have a horse master degree. I'm involved in musical theater and I am a professional speaker. I'm constantly in front of a crowd. I do television shows four or five times a year. I think it was never difficult because of the love and encouragement of my family. They always talked about all the great notoriety I would get because I would learn how to do things with one hand that most people had trouble doing with two. We were all very excited about that. That was the main focus, not the handicap. Your daughter does not have a problem. She is normal. You are the one who will teach her to think of herself as anything else. She will come to know she is different, but you will teach her that different is wonderful. Normal means you are average. What's fun about that? She was silent for a while. Then she simply said, thank you, and walked out. I sat there thinking, why do these things have to happen? Everything happens for a reason. Even that forklift falling on my hand. All the circumstances leading up to me being at this doctor's office and this moment in time happened for a reason. The doctor came in, looked at my throat, and said he wanted to anesthetize and put a probe down it to examine it. Well, singers are very paranoid about putting medical instruments down their throats, especially ones so rough they need to be anesthetized. I said, no thanks, and walked out. The next day, my throat was completely better. Why do these things have to happen?